A couple of weeks ago, I went to Cape Town as my father-in-law turned 70. He invited us to lunch and he picked a place with the type of food that I'm sure won't be easily replicated elsewhere. The setting was perfect, the view was amazing, the wine was picked, and the food presented as artistic, tiny little creations in large plates. I'll admit I needed an explanation before I knew what I was eating. We sat for hours around the table and there were speeches, there was laughter, even a couple of funny moments. Reflecting back, I remember I wasn't originally going to make this lunch. I wasn't going to be able to attend. My husband and the kids were going to go alone. But my father-in-law invited me again after I respectfully declined saying I wouldn't be able to come. And in this invitation, I realized he wanted me there. There is a place at the table for me. What if we realize that God invites us to the banquet of a life with him too? He wants us there. And why? Because he's eager to spend time with us, to celebrate with us, to laugh with us, bless us. He wants to receive and spoil us at his table. With this birthday lunch, I realized just in time I didn't want to miss this, whatever my even legitimate excuses were. How do we respond to God's heartfelt, eager invitation to attend this meal and eat with him. Read with me how Jesus tells this parable. Luke 14, verse 15 to 24. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the slave said, sir, what you ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, None of those who were invited will taste my dinner. As you read and listen to the scripture, what caught your attention? What captured your heart, even just for a moment? A couple of phrases for me, come for everything is ready. There is still room. Compel people so that my house may be filled. Taste my dinner. I love how Jesus works with people to convey deeply meaningful truths. In this chapter, he goes to eat at one of the Pharisees' houses. He knows he's being carefully watched. Suspicion colors the atmosphere. And in this already tense space, controversy arises. Jesus asks, can I heal this man on the Sabbath? Can you imagine the Pharisees' expression as they find themselves right in the middle of their self-created catch-22? As they remain silent, Jesus then heals the man, but the Pharisees are not happy. So Jesus subtly tells a story about humility, how easily pride and being right can stand in the way of what really matters. But he continues, there's more that can displace this kingdom life with God. And if we've ever tasted what God has to offer, we know we don't want to miss his banquet. Let's first consider the invitation. Blessed is the guest. This is not your I'm making dinner anyway type of invitation. It's a seat at the table of God. It's God offering himself to us as a companion. It's an invitation to intimacy and reciprocity. It's community with him and with his body. It's connection, fellowship, it's conversation, it's sustenance, it's joy, it's celebration. 
It's sharing in the king's abundance. In a recent conversation with a friend, she spoke of this invitation as being one of mutual indwelling. God in us and us in God. A feast of togetherness. Isn't it quite something that the kingdom of God is so personal, so close, so different to the authoritarian view of ancient kingdoms we may have, a feast with the one who chooses and wants to be with us. And this is not the first reference of life with God being a feast. Isaiah 25 verse 6 says, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Psalm 23 verse 5 says, You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. When the prodigal son comes home, there is a feast. In Revelations, we are invited to the banquet of the Lamb. It seems that this picture of feast or banquet that Jesus gives us is really significant to our understanding of what life with him now is as well as the journey that it leads us to. So then, if God as the hospitable, generous, joyous host does not form part of our image of who he is, then we may be holding on to a one-sided picture of him. The invitation that Jesus is unraveling here is to recognize and accept his lavish love as he welcomes us into his presence. And we are so blessed by his presence. Here at this table, we get to know him. And in turn, we also get to know who we really are and what really matters in the kingdom perspective of things. Things begin to shift as our perspective changes. All of the things we think will give us what we need and what we want. We in fact find in the truest, most wholesome sense here with him, in this communion of love, we find what we physically need, sustenance for mind, body and soul, all our felt needs considered and cared for by our host. We find what we emotionally need, approval, belonging, affirmation. We find we are welcome. We find what we desire, joy, pleasure, beauty. And should we notice his expression as we enjoy and savor what he puts in front of us, we would see his contentment and joy as we accept what he offers. So we know we are among the guests who are invited to this divine feast. We know our host throws an awesome party. He's generous towards his guests. We know that what he serves will be marvelous. And perhaps we want to go, just not now. Maybe because we think we can go later another time. Or perhaps because there's something we just have to quickly do. And this is what Jesus is warning us against. In the parable, he points us to the excuses we all live with that displace kingdom life. Let's take a moment to look at these disordered attachments that keep us from the table. The excuse. Please accept my regrets. I chose this translation because in this response, the declining of an invite, the word regret resounds within me. We often pretend we don't, we don't really want to decline, but alas, we have to. There's something so important that has come up or stands in the way. In this scripture, a piece of land, perhaps in today's life, our material needs, everything tangible that I can touch and possess or seek to possess. Now, having things is not wrong. In fact, what you own are gifts from God, blessings. But they can take in an inappropriate place in our lives. We can become completely driven and consumed by what we own or what we don't have. It can begin to define us. It can lead us to fear of not having enough or to self-sufficient, ever-increasing, relentless chasing of security. 
discontentment, jealousy, pride, comparison, instead of greater freedom, when our felt needs become attachments that displace God in the center of our lives, they simply lead to a beautifully luscious prison, often lonely and unfulfilling. Each of our prisons with our own unique touch of self-inflicted suffering. And this life driven by possessions is a demanding life. The upkeep is high. So we regretfully send our excuse. We cannot attend now. The second example of an excuse in the parable is oxen. Now oxen were a means to achieve success and status. Maybe it says something of ambition. This man's response, I'm sorry, I just need to go and see them, try them out. Was it really so important in this moment or did he just feel really important in bringing it up here? Don't we do that? Find ways to turn the light to us, to something that make us feel valued and worthy for others to see. We consciously or unconsciously pursue things, projects, successes, and find our value in this. And should we get the opportunity and it shows how impressive we are, then we feel accomplished. Oh, this brittle-boned ego. The guest regretfully declined his seat at the table as we so often do ours. Maybe we even fantasize on how we'll be missed while our ambition consumes us. And then the excuse of a new marriage. What could this refer to? The experience of a honeymoon, pleasure? Let me just have my little pleasures, my addictions, my numbing agents, my distractions. We deserve an escape from a brutal, cruel, ruthlessly paced world, don't we? We just want to feel good, even if it's just for a moment. Maybe it's how a particular person makes you feel, or it's a situation that feels nice, or it's an escape from reality. And whatever makes us feel good has great value, at least for now. So, I'm so sorry, we won't be able to make it. Not possessions or ambition or pleasure is wrong, but it can take very destructive and inhibiting places in our lives. Instead of aligning with the kingdom life, the invitation to this feast, we resist. And our host is angered. And the word used here for anger can be translated as provoked or irritated or frustrated. But it can also mean exasperated, almost like a parent would be in trying to get his child to stop a destructive habit and choose what is good for him. He doesn't want to lose him. So his frustration and anger builds up at this impending loss if the, exp- if the excuses don't stop. God may be exasperated at our continuous choices that keep us from the life he hopes and dreams for us. The poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame seem to be less resistant. Maybe because their arms are not already burdened with so much that seems so much more important. Maybe because they see more clearly that it is an honor to be invited or they recognize that they have a deep desire to attend. But here, today, even if you've offered a hundred excuses, Jesus offers again, invites you again. He compels you to come and enjoy because he doesn't want you to miss out on this feast of a life with him. He wants his table full with the members of his body. So come, sit, attend. Which brings us to the feast. Get a taste. The kingdom of God is here and it is yet to come. It is God's will embodied now, but it is also what we are hoping for as we journey towards being with him in perfect unity. It is transformational life with Jesus. It is his gentle rulership growing in the lives of each of us. And we can get a taste of that now as we discover a way of life that follows in his footsteps. He is so hopeful that we will sit down at the table with him. How? Well, sometimes we are the first guests spoken of in the parable. We are busy, hurrying around, achieving and performing and maybe succeeding or building, perhaps even flourishing in some sense. 
If that is where you are, don't let busyness and all the other excuses keep you from the table. Say yes to the invitation and come to the feast daily. This asks of you to be present to God in your life, to be vulnerable in recognizing your default excuses, and then to make it a priority, to make time to pray and to meditate on God's word, to spend time in his presence, to recognize how he comes to you in your life, to pursue that which leads to a greater response of love. Find an inner world of joy that isn't shaken by external material possessions, success, or short-lived pursuits of pleasure. Get a taste of what life with him is like. Savor it. Return to it frequently and form habits and practices that help you make your home here. But sometimes we are the lame, the crippled, the blind. We can't bring ourselves to the banquet. We're not, we're not resistant. We're just exhausted or completely broken. Who will bring you to the banquet? Which friend or mentor or family member do you know will show up at the feast and will carry you there while you car cannot carry yourself? Allow your community to bring you in. In those times, you can't bring yourself. Receive their prayer. Have the spiritual conversations that remind you that you are welcome just as you are. Experience the love of your host as his body shares his compassion. And when you come across someone who needs to be brought to the feast, who is lost in busyness or hurt and blinded by hopelessness, be that person who carries another there. Compel them to come in and sit the way that Jesus has compelled you. Because every time we take our seat at the table, we see that Jesus has made room for more. We start to feel his eagerness and urgency in wanting his people there with him. He longs for them. He longs for us. We can get a taste of this life even if we thought we had no capacity and even if we were convinced we had no right to attend. I think we only sort of get it right sometimes. Sitting down then easily distracted and ca being called away, surprised by yet another form of excuse that, that takes us. But there is still room. Every yes that helps us recognize his presence and sustenance is a feast. One person I think made an who made an intentional practice of tasting the feast, is Brother Lawrence, who was a 17th century Carmelite monk in France. He was assigned to kitchen duty in the monastery, where he prepared and cooked the food for the day, and he cleaned up afterwards. And he began to infuse his relationship with God into even his menial tasks. Instead of just doing the dishes or cooking the meal, he decided to have an ongoing conversation with God as he went about his chores. Brother Lawrence believed God could be invited into everything he did and his presence could be enjoyed any time. So he didn't only meet God in his set prayer times, but also retreated to a place in his heart where the love of God made every detail of his life valuable. Together, God and Brother Lawrence cooked meals, ran errands, scrubbed pots, and endured the scorn of the world. He said yes to the invitation to come to the banquet of a life with Jesus. He said, there is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of a continual conversation with God. Those only can comprehend it who practice and experience it. His life was not without trials and tribulations, as ours are not either. And yet, the feast is now, in spite of, in the midst of all the challenges and brokenness we may face. May we say yes in all the ways he invites us to respond. May we take each other there and find each other there. He's invited us to this life with him. Shall we accept the invitation? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking the time and being so intentional 
but how you invite us to experience this personal, intimate, big life with you. Thank you for the joy that you invite us to. Thank you for the intimacy. Thank you, Lord, that you compel us to come again and again. Give us the grace to say yes, to turn to you and to come and sit at the table. Thank you for your love that pursues us. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The love of Jesus Christ, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and this life with God is given to you. Amen.